Well, hello there, Ramblers, and welcome back to Reese Rambles, my weekly podcast all about the comings and goings and movings and shakings and all the rest of it in the worlds of vintage and retro computing and technology and gaming, I guess. Um, yeah, a bit of a mixed bag, as always. Hope you're all doing well. I know some of you like to let me know how you're getting on down in the comments here on YouTube, which is very nice. I always appreciate it. Do enjoy reading the comments on these rambles. And of course, also a bit of a reminder that this does also go out on all of the uh, podcast platforms. So I upload it to Spotify, and then somehow it magically uh, makes its way out to all of the other platforms as well. Google is Google Podcasts? I don't think Google Podcasts is still a thing, is it? But Apple and um, all the other ones, there's some obscure ones that some of you listen to me on that I hadn't even heard of uh, that people have mentioned. So good to know that the system works. But uh, yeah, a lovely uh, crisp autumn weekend here in the UK. The temperature has increased slightly. I know you all appreciate my uh, my weekly weather forecasts. So there you go. And tomorrow is a very big day. So as I sit here recording this on uh, Friday, the 18th of October, I'm also mentally preparing for uh, a, a big appearance, a big celebrity appearance tomorrow on a very important live stream, a charity live stream. So you are probably familiar with Lee from More Fun Making It. He's a very good friend of mine. I actually interviewed him. I say interviewed him. We had we had a really nice chat uh, on one of these uh, on an earlier one of these rambles. And uh, he's uh, you know he's an absolute uh, pillar of the retro community. He's a bloody lovely guy, very supportive, and he makes great videos as well. And a big part of what he does is uh, his uh, his annual charity live stream. I say annual. He's done a few of these things. I'm not sure he'd want to uh, commit to it becoming an annual thing, but. Um, He's raised so much money over the past couple of them for some really great charities, and he's doing it again this year for a charity called The Befriending Scheme, which is uh, one that I know is uh, very, very dear to his heart. And a load of us are getting involved and helping out, and we're going to be appearing over the course of the day. So I will uh, link that down in the description. That is all day tomorrow. And I will also talk about that a bit later on uh, in this week's ramble. I'll probably end on it. I don't know. I'm not that organised. Just to give you a bit of a reminder and to give you something to uh, potentially go and check out uh, once you finish listening to this. And in fact, if it's going on at the moment as you are listening to this, go and watch that instead because it's more important. Anyway, let's get on with the stories for this week. So first up, let's start with a bit of a correction from last week's ramble. And my apologies for this. I messed up uh, in quite a big way. So this was uh, actually in the title of last week's ramble. It was in the description and I even created a chapter for it somehow. But uh, the story didn't actually make it in. And I actually ended up deleting the source file for that. I was I was feeling quite clever when I sat down to record this because I thought, you know what, I'll just drop that in and we'll just include it. Of course, the camera setup's always ever so slightly different or whatever, but I could I could introduce it and just play the clip. Um, but yeah, apparently I deleted it, so I'm going to have to re-record this story. But yes, uh, there was mention of the Sega Saturn Mr. Core and some news to do with that. It was only a very small story that I kind of tacked onto the end of another one, but uh, a lot of people were asking about it because, well, it, it wasn't there and it was supposed to be. So let's uh, have a look at that. And this is over on timeextension.com. And basically, it has been declared that the Mr. FPGA Saturn Core is now the most accurate way to play outside of real hardware. Of course, the Sega Saturn being uh, an increasingly rare and expensive console, uh, particularly to pick up some of the uh, some of the kind of uh, less common games for it as well. And this is one of the things that I'm a really big fan of Mr. for. Uh, hopefully, Mr. needs no introduction. Of course, it's that FPGA-based uh, gaming platform. The most accurate way to uh, kind of going to use the word emulate, but you know what I mean. The most accurate way to kind of uh, recreate these old computers and consoles and things from back in the day. And I'm also a really big fan of the Saturn Core. And a big reason for that is because, not, I mean, not only is it a console that I don't know much about and don't really have any experience of and don't own, uh, but also because in the very early days of Mister, a lot of people said that it wouldn't be possible and they'd never be able to do Sega Saturn, the N64, of course, being the other one. And now the Saturn Core is uh, becoming much, much more mature and it's doing wonderful, wonderful things. So um, I do like to report on it when when it has some good news. So uh, yeah, I mean, the story over on Time Extension kind of leads with all of that kind of same sentiment, so I won't go over that again. Uh, but basically, uh, the uh, SRG320, who is the developer of the Saturn Core, uh, has recently been updated 
and it comes with it some incredible improvements when it comes to accuracy. Uh, according to Video Game Esoterica, the RAM controller has been rewritten and fixed up, offering improved performance that is so close to original hardware that SCSP test, which uh, runs through the various audio processes the Sega Saturn hardware does, uh, comes out with a complete pass when playing certain games. And that means the test is seeing one-for-one -one parity with real hardware, of course. Audio has always been a bit of an issue with the Saturn core. Uh, the speed of the RAM timings and things has always been a bit of a, a bit of a hurdle. But this is quite a major milestone because they've actually actually managed to fix those issues. And yeah, apparently that makes it the most accurate way to enjoy those Sega Saturn games on anything other than uh, the original real hardware, which is absolutely fantastic. So uh, yeah, that was just the story that I was going to include last week. I've probably spent more time talking about it this week than I did last week, but I know some people were keen to hear that. Um, the other thing is, although the Saturn Core is still in, technically still in beta, it is part of the update all script. So if you're using that to update your mister, as I'm sure the vast majority of us are, just run that and you'll have the latest version and you should have all of that uh, wonderful audio accuracy available to you. So that's the story about the Sega Sega <laughs> that's the story about the Sega Saturn Core dear old dear uh, that got dropped from last week's episode and I'm going to as soon as I hit stop on this I'm going to copy it into the correct folder I'm going to make sure it's definitely in there and it's definitely right and it definitely doesn't get missed again. And I'm going to continue in that vein for my next story as well. Uh, that vein not being me cocking things up, uh, at least I hope not anyway, although this is about the fourth or fifth take of attempting to record this story. Uh, no, the vein is exploring games on systems that I don't really have any personal hands-on experience with or, um, you know, that I never got the chance to own back in the day. And this is a weird one. This is an obscure one. And... I love everything about this. So this story was actually posted over on the uh, over on Neil's Discord on, on the RMC Discord by Mike Daly, the uh, Lemmings guy. Yeah, that's that's. I think that's pretty much all he's ever done. Lemmings. He loves to be known as the Lemmings guy. Um, but yeah, uh, Mike Daly posted this. It's not the first time I've. Uh, stolen a story from Neil's Discord, and I'm sure it won't be the last, although it wasn't an official submission to This Week in Retro, so I think that's okay. Uh, but yeah, he posted this just out of interest, and uh, there was a bit of a discussion around it, and I it really struck a chord with me. So let's just have a look at it. This is a collection of Commodore 16 and Plus 4 games for the Game Boy. These are ports of Commodore 16 and Plus 4 games, and this is a physical release as well. This is This is so obscure, and it's so cool. So this is on WLS.hu. This is the actual developer's site. And uh, I will let them speak for themselves. So the intro goes, I had a dream when I got... I will let them speak for themselves. Let's try this again. Uh, I had a dream when I got my first Game Boy handheld console. I wanted to play the Commodore 16 and plus four games from my childhood in a portable way that I could take with me on trips. We had to wait a long time. And in the end, it wasn't because someone made an emulator but because I rewrote the games myself. Enjoy this collection. So this is a real passion project. And I love this kind of thing. So there's a pre-order link over on InsideGadgets.com, which we will go and have a look at in a moment. Uh, but look at this, this physical package, you know, it comes in a really nice sort of presentation box with a proper printed manual. You know, those little, um, you know, those little uh, kind of flip book type manuals that Game Boy games used to come with back in the day. Very, very nostalgic, proper cartridge and everything. And it says there are a total of 16 games in the collection, including Jet Set Willy and Monty on the Run, which you can see below. Uh, we want you to have as much fun as possible with these games. So we have also made the booklet available to you in PDF format at the bottom of this page. So just like the good old days when you picked up a new game and used to sit in the back of your, uh, you know, in the back of the car, flipping through the uh, the manual, really uh, desperate to uh, get get on and play the game when you got home. Probably less of an issue with the Game Boy, I guess, but because um, you could have played it there and then. But you know what I mean? Flipping through the manual before you actually get the physical game is always an exciting time. Uh, and there's a list of the actual games here. So we've got Treasure Island, Commando, Out on a Limb, Monty on the Run, Cuthbert in the Cooler, Astro Plumber, Ghost Town, Jet Set Willy, G-Man, Finders Keepers, Spiky Harold... <laughs> Uh, AutoZone, Heebie Jeebies, Cave Fighter, Leaper, and Tower of Evil. So, uh, quite a few absolute classics in that list, and also quite a few games that I am actually not all that familiar with, which is quite interesting. And uh, yeah, so you can scroll down here, and we've got full 
uh, oh, we've got the uh, an interactive flipbook first. Let's let's not skip over this because this is really nice. So if you go to this website, and of course this will be linked, just like everything else from all the other stories this week, uh, you can actually flip through the flipbook yourself, and it's it's interactive. This is really lovely. So obviously, of course, Commando, a port of the uh, the well known arcade game. I covered that quite recently on the uh, the Atari seventy eight hundred. Um, yeah, we've got uh, you know some little screenshots and some information on all of these games. Got Monty on the run, of course, Monty Mole. Cuthbert in the cooler. I mean, it's, yeah, just classics, absolute classics. And you can scroll down, and there's also uh, like some little animated things here. I like the way this kind of flops around as you as you wave your mouse over it. Shiny. I always get distracted by shiny things in these things. But uh, we've got the full credits here, of course, from the uh, original developers, release dates, and a little bit of a video as well of each game in action. So nice little website, really nice little project, and very much, uh, very much down my street. There's also a YouTube video, and of course, um, I will also link to that. Why not? And let's go through to this pre-order site, because I haven't actually looked at this yet, so we're going to be checking this out together live. So it's a really nice physical release. There's a nice, uh, you know, solid-looking box. There's a, a Commodore logo uh, foam inset thing, which obviously uh, holds the physical cartridge and the manual. We've got the physical cartridge, proper original Game Boy cartridge. And just a nice little box. So the prices seem to range from $29 to $59. Uh, coming soon, around the 1st of November. So there's not even that long to wait. There's only a couple of weeks away. And uh, yeah, uh, we have options here. So you can have the cart. Oh, I see. Okay. So for $29, you can have the cart. And for $59, you can have the booklet, the box, and the cart. And that's actually for such a kind of low production run uh, passion project type thing that's i think that's actually really reasonable so yeah really great project this um it, it caught my eye and i thought it looked fantastic and to be fair that's pretty much the only criteria that you need to make it into a ramble so um yeah commodore 16 and plus four pack for the original game boy so an update now on a story from a few weeks back. It's uh, it's all been happening. It's all very interesting. This is to do with Winamp and its open source. Uh, it turns out a very short-lived open source release. So I reported a few weeks back that the current owners of Winamp, of course, that's a very fondly remembered media player from the uh, the kind of the late nineties. Uh, the current owners of that, and it has it has passed through multiple owners over the years. It's a whole torrid tale, but. Um, the current owners of that open sourced it, so they put all of the source code on GitHub, and it was very controversial at the time because not only did we not get the source code for the original uh, kind of early 90s versions of that media player, which is what everyone was really looking forward to, but they also used a really weird license that meant that uh, basically you didn't have the rights to do anything at all with the code, which was completely useless. And there have there, there were further developments in that story, uh, in that uh, it turned out that they'd actually included some stuff in there that they shouldn't have done, that they shouldn't have been distributing um, secret keys that gave access to all sorts of things that uh, people shouldn't have had access to, and uh, bits of licensed stuff that they didn't have the license to distribute. And now there has been another development in that tale, uh, probably probably a very predictable one. Uh, yeah, let's go to the register and uh, see what this says. And ultimately. Uh, the clue is entirely in the headline. I appreciate if you're watching this on YouTube that my face is covering part of the headline, so apologies for that. But uh, headline here is opening up the Winamp source to all goes badly as owners delete entire repo. So, yep, that's it. Very short-lived. They released the source code to it. Uh, they did it all completely wrong in many, many different ways, probably all, the different, all of the different ways you could, you could possibly get it wrong. Uh, and now they've deleted it. So what a massive waste of time. Uh, it says here, oh, the the, uh, the little subheading here as well, opening up the Winamp source to all goes badly as owners delete entire repo. And the subheading is, as badly as the later development of the player itself, really. God, I love the register. I've been read reading the register since, what, 2000? How long has it been? How long has it been around? It's got to be the early 2000s, probably even before. I don't know when it started. Anyway, so the owners of Winamp have just deleted their entire repo one month after uploading the source code to Git GitHub. Lots of source code and quite possibly not all of it theirs. The deletion happened soon after the register inquired about the seeming inclusion of Shoutcast DNAS code and some Microsoft and Intel codecs. Uh, and then there's a whole bit here about how Winamp is being still around and kind of talking about the background of the source code release. And indeed the, uh, the license and how there was no forking allowed and... Um, 
kind of not an open source license in the slightest. Give people access to look at the source, uh, but if you actually wanted to modify it in any way, that that code was all the process was all actually kind of under the ownership of what were they called, the Llama Group, something like that. Yeah, the, the Llama Group. Uh, that that code actually became owned by them, and you couldn't actually release it, so it was all completely pointless. So uh, yeah, really great uh, kind of summary of the whole. Um, short-lived escapade here over on the register. Of course, I will link that in the usual places if you want to go and give that a read. Um, but that's pretty much the long and the short of it. Yeah, released the source code. Wasn't the source code that people wanted. Did it in completely the wrong way. Also released a load of stuff that they didn't intend to and that they shouldn't have done. And now they've unreleased it. Now, earlier I mentioned Mr. and specifically the Sega Saturn core and some quite impressive improvements that have been happening with that core. And there is some more FPGA news this week. And of course, Mr. isn't the only player in town when it comes to FPGA. There is a big uh, commercial offering. Of course, the Mr. stuff is all kind of open source and kind of hobbyist. Uh, there is the uh, the big commercial offering in the form of Analog and their much loved Analog Pocket. And I appreciate this is one of those companies that a lot of people kind of have thoughts and opinions on. Uh, so don't shoot the messenger. I don't own any Analog hardware. I'm quite happy with my Mr. But uh, it makes a lot of people happy. And there has been a, quite a big coordinated effort to port a lot of the Mr. cores to Analog's own system. Of course, it uses a slightly different FPGA. And I know a lot of the uh, kind of the big Mister developers are on board with that. So, who am I to second guess them? But a new analog console has been announced this week, and of course, it is in our it is in our ballpark. So, um, let's cover it. And um, there are some aspects of this announcement I should say going into this uh, that really made me laugh. Um, Analog's marketing people are quite strange. They've said some odd things in the past, and their new console is no exception. So, let's dive into this. This is the Analog 3D, and this, of course, is their take on the N64. I'm not quite sure why I said of course, but of course, Nintendo's 64-bit uh, console from, uh, what was it, 97, the N64 released, and they have created their own version entirely in FPGA, upscales to 4K, supports the original controllers, and adds a load of nice new features as well. So quite a cool uh, cool implementation of this, $249.99, which to be fair, if you buy a you know a nice, shiny, decent condition, original console boxed and everything, it's probably not all that far off that now, especially if you've got to do HDMI mods and stuff to it as well. And it's probably not going to be as good as this. I mean, yeah, fair play. Um, but the description, the description did amuse me. So it's a reimagining of the N64 in 4K resolution, 10 times the resolution of the original N64. There's a little star next to this, and I couldn't actually work out where that goes, but I'll take their word for it that 4K is 10 times the resolution of the original N64. Probably based on... Um, I don't know what that's based on. Uh, but it says, the first and perhaps greatest multiplayer system of all time. Now, I mean, the greatest multiplayer system of all time... Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it depends on your kind of personal experience and stuff and I guess your age and what you grew up with and all that kind of thing. But the first multiplayer system of all time? Really? Um, I'm, I'm, I, I think I remember uh, multiplayer games existing before 1997. Um, I mean, being charitable, I guess, were there any consoles with four controller ports before the N64? Yes, actually, the Atari 800... I know it was a computer. Uh, that's got four controller ports, and there were four player games. In fact, Warlords on the Atari 2600 uses four paddles, and that was, what was that, 1977? So, no, no, I'm not, uh, I don't agree with that, that the uh, the N64 was the, uh, the, <laughs> the first multiplayer system of all time. But anyway, anyway, I am getting sidetracked here. Analog 3D is 100% compatible with every original N64 game ever made, and it's region-free, which is really cool. Uh, they've also added Bluetooth, which I guess is, is so you can use Bluetooth controllers. And of course, I think it's 8-bit do. Do they do a Bluetooth conversion for the original N64 controllers? And they, they do like new joystick centers and things for them as well. So you could probably go to town on this and like pimp it out with original, you know, wireless versions of the original controllers and stuff if you wanted to. Uh, they've also added Wi-Fi uh, and four original controller ports, so you can actually plug the original controllers into it for that authentic experience. Entirely new, next-generation analog hardware featuring 3D OS. 
which of course is their own uh, bes bespoke custom proprietary, that's the word I'm looking for, operating system, engineered entirely in FPGA, no emulation. And I know when they came up with that tagline, um, I can't remember which console it was, but uh, th there was quite a lot of chatter about that, quite a lot of discussion about whether FPGA counts as emulation as not or not. Um, look at the dictionary definition of emulation. Yeah, I'd say that it is, actually. But I appreciate that they're trying to differentiate themselves from stuff like Raspberry Pi and software emulation and stuff like that. But still doesn't quite sit right with me. In engineered entirely in FPGA, no emulation. But there you go. Um, evidently, they've managed to accurately recreate the logic of the original, uh, you know, the GPU, of course, which was developed by SGI back in the day, Silicon Graphics. A very kind of powerful and exciting hardware at the time. And I quite like it. I think it's quite a cool project. Um, probably not going to buy one. I'm more than happy with my mister. But hey, these things exist and you can slap your original cartridges into it and enjoy them that way as well. So it's a thing. It's cool. Just the uh, announcement is a bit odd. My next story this week starts with a question, as they quite often do. Uh, do you own an original Sega Tower of Power? I'm talking, of course, about the uh, Mega Drive, or Genesis if you prefer, and its lovely add-ons. Here's a picture here. Uh, we have the uh, Sega CD on the bottom, and then we have the uh, Mega Drive, or the Genesis. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to call it the Mega Drive from now on. Uh, slotted on top of that. And then, of course, you have the 32X, which goes into the cartridge slot of the Mega Drive and adds 32-bit capabilities, among other things. I must admit the Mega Drive isn't... Uh, I did own one back in the day, but it's not one of my areas of, of kind of expertise, really. But um, if you are one of the people who are fortunate enough to own this, and apparently this isn't something that works in the Mr. Core or in any of the current uh, FPGA setups, although... Uh, you know, evidently people will be working on it. Uh, but if you are lucky enough to own this original hardware, plus some other bits and pieces, uh, then you might be in a position to enjoy a really big release from this week. So this was sent to me by Matthias Bayus. I think that's how you say it. Uh, the retro Sega game dev. And he has his own YouTube channel and he is working on a really epic uh, game for the Mega Drive, by the way, just as a complete aside. Uh, something that I am going to be reporting on as there is some news on that. But um, I've seen some very early bits and pieces of that and it does look very cool. So it is something that I will be covering in future. But for now, he has sent me this story on someone else's project. And I love this because it's Doom. That's right. More Doom news this week. This is Doom CD32X Fusion 1.0. And uh, yeah, the 1.0 release. Uh, so it's the first ever non-FMV release for Duo of Add-ons for the Sega Genesis. The Duo of Add-ons being the uh, Sega CD and the uh, 32X, of course. So this is uh, new ports of Doom 1 and 2, a selection of maps from TNT and more. Over 100 maps and 96 FM tracks. So that's uh, FM music tracks. It's crazy how much stuff is just included in this. So Doom... Doom CD32X Fusion marks an exciting evolution of the Doom 32X Resurrection project, presenting the first non-full motion video game to leverage the power of the CD32X. Get ready for a groundbreaking gaming experience powered by Sega's cutting-edge technology. With all five processors and multimedia capabilities of the formidable tower of power at your disposal, you'll dive into a Doom adventure like never before. So, this is... Doom and Doom 2, of course, and it, was, it is also the 30th anniversary of Doom 2 this year, and indeed the Sega 32X, so a very fitting release. And it says here, revel in the opportunity to stand proudly alongside the most dedicated fans, with no need to envy those Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn owners any longer. Of course, uh, the uh, PlayStation and Saturn ports of Doom actually being among the, uh, the best ones on the consoles. You can even unleash your creativity by designing your own Doom worlds with the included development WAD. Burn your creations onto CD to enjoy a solo game or challenge a friend in split screen or linked cable multiplayer modes. They've really gone to town on this and this is really cool. So the hardware required for this, uh, you will need the complete tower of power setup, so a Mega Drive or Genesis, plus a Sega CD, plus a 32X. You'll need a flash cart, you'll need a functional CD burner, and you'll need a CDR for burning the ISO image. So yeah, uh, if you own all of those things, and it says if you prefer to experience the game through emulation, Ares is your go-to choice, so it does work in an emulator. Uh, but as of now, there are no compatible FPGA add-ons for this configuration, so real hardware is required. Get ready to embark on this unforgettable journey into the depths of doom. 
And of course, I will link to this. There's a huge list of stuff they've got. Uh, you know, they've done like high resolution uh, textures and weapon sprites, enemy sprites. They've, they've they've done so much stuff here. I mean, and look at this. I wouldn't even know where to start with reading this list. I'm not going to read the entire list, but uh, you know, you've got a choice of different uh, screen resolutions. Um, like I say, you've got that high resolution uh, textures and things in there as well. Got the, the new soundtrack. Uh, they've, they've, they've added all sorts of stuff, all sorts of stuff. And of course, all sorts of fixes to the original uh, 32X release of Doom, which did have its issues. And that was kind of, uh, I believe, the roots of this whole, I was going to say the genesis of this whole project. I should have gone with that, shouldn't I? Because that was much funnier. Uh, but yeah, the roots of this whole project, of course, were in essentially trying to fix the original 32X version of Doom. And they've just gone massively over and above that, which is very cool. So yeah, uh, and this is what we've got. You've got uh, the ultimate Doom, including episode four, uh, Doom 2, new five new TNT maps. You've got the uh, 27 maps from Doom 32X. Uh, you've got the uh, music tracks for Doom 1, 1, 2, Plutonia and TNT and others that you can play outside of the game. Uh, and you've got a development uh, wad as well if you want to, uh, you know, if you, want, if, if you want to build your own maps for this thing. So <laughs> I love this. This is so cool. And these screenshots look really good as well. I mean, you know, this is very much on par with the uh, PC version of Doom. Just looking at some of these screenshots. And I, I love these passion projects. I'm sure you're probably learning that from this week's episode, aren't you? So, yep, if you own a uh, Sega Mega Drive and a Mega CD and a 32X and a flash cart for it and have a working CD burner and have some spare CDRs lying around, the link to uh, check this out is down in the description. And I would very much like to hear your experiences in the comments as well. Right then, I'm going to mix things up a little bit this week as far as the running order is concerned for reasons that should hopefully become obvious very soon. So rather than doing a video of the week and then ending on something else, I'm going to talk a little bit about my latest release and I promise you this will be quick and painless. So yeah, seven weeks in a row on a Friday I have released videos. Not really pushing for it, not really rushing stuff, but um, it's giving me something to aim for at the moment and I'm having a really good time doing it. So yeah, I released another video today and this one is doing exceptionally well and I knew it would because it's a very interesting topic and I'm really pleased that it is doing well because part of the whole idea of it uh, is to do with um, putting a bit of a call for information out there for anyone who knows about this stuff and I have had some feedback as well which is really cool so I will talk about that in a moment but um yeah, uh, there will be some spoilers here as well not just to do with uh, what happens at the end of this video but also um, what happened kind of after I finished filming as well. So if you don't want to spoil that and you haven't seen the video yet, uh, go watch that and then come back. But um, this is to do with the Sefucom 21, and that's, it's that weird Japanese computer that I bought on uh, one of the Japanese auction sites that has what looks like a screen on one side, but it isn't actually a screen. It's a weird mechanical thing, which I do talk a bit about in the video. So let's have a look at this. Uh, this video has got 2.3 times the usual number of views that a release would get on my channel. Uh, it's got 5,400 views. So what is this? We're coming up to uh, uh, first seven hours and 20 minutes. So yeah, in the first seven and a half hours, it's going to have done you know, 5,500 views, which apparently is 3,000 more than usual. And it's gained 70 new subscribers as well because it does end on a bit of a cliffhanger. That cliff cliffhanger, of course, being, if you've seen the video, uh, the fact that it doesn't actually work at the end. Um, but there is a pinned comment with a bit of an update on that. So it turns out uh, it does it does actually work. I, I actually managed to get it working. I won't reveal the exact details of that until part two, uh, but it was um, between, between you and me. It, it was a very easy fix and a bit of a silly oversight on my part. I've also managed to track down the software for it, which is one of the things I kind of put the call out for in that video. And it was really weird. So I, I uploaded the video and sent it out to my supporters. And then I thought, let's just, let's just have a look on Zen Market at, uh, at the Yahoo auctions and see what's on there. And someone was selling a basically brand new, unused, complete set of software for it. Now, I ended up paying quite a lot of money for that. But that's why we have sponsors and, and patrons and all the rest of it. And ultimately, it means that I get to demo this thing working, which is fantastic. And also, I think I think when I'm done with it, I'm probably going to donate it to, to a museum or something because... It's absolutely fascinating and having it lying around here doing nothing is, uh, 
a massive waste, I think. But yeah, so that's the video. It's, uh, you know, it's five, five and a half thousand views near enough in its first seven and a half hours. But the important thing is that it's getting the word out and I'm getting some really good feedback. I've already had uh, some information from someone who's cousin was a teacher in Japan and actually used these. So this is an English language teaching computer, custom built for that purpose for use in schools. And uh, this person has contacted me and said that, uh, yeah, my cousin actually worked in a school in Japan in the 80s and actually used these machines. And they actually gave me some really useful information on that. So of course, I will be talking about that in part two as well. But just great to see that the video is doing well and that it's kind of resonating with people. And ultimately, it's a weird machine. So it's just a really fun one to check out. So yeah, that's how uh, that's my latest release and that's the latest channel update for this week. So let's finish on something important. And finally, something for you to check out this weekend if you're at a bit of a loose end, something that's an all day event on the Saturday. That's Saturday, the 19th of October. It is, of course, this all day charity live stream. And I'm going to make this my video of the week as well, because there is a fantastic little introduction to this. And it's 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 huge. I mean, the names involved with this, we've got, um, you know, we've got the This Week in Retro crew. They've got their own slot for a couple of hours. We've got Adrian Black. We've got Jan Beta. We've got uh, we've got the Australians, uh, Mark from the Retro Channel. Uh, Mr. Lurch, uh, Chris, 005 Agima from uh, from uh, This Week in Retro, of course. Um, I don't know why I've started listing names because there's no way I can give you the complete list here because there's just far too many people involved. So apologies to everyone that uh, didn't get a mention just there. But um, yeah, of course, also I'm involved. But um, this is uh, this. So this is uh, selling Commodore computers to buy mini donkeys for charity plus a live stream schedule. So this is for a charity called the Befriending Scheme, and they run they run a farm. I mean, they do they do quite a lot of stuff, but uh, this specifically, they run a farm for people with um, quite specialist needs. You know, pe people uh, with additional needs, people uh, who would struggle to get kind of real world of hands on experience of this kind of stuff. And it, it's an absolutely fantastic charity. It's not something that I could really do justice to if I tried to explain it myself. And it is all covered in the video. And it is uh, it is a charity that is very dear to, to Lee's heart as well, because it's something that's, that, you know, they've helped out, helped his family out a lot over the years. So in this video, he uh, introduces the, the charity and, of course, the event, talks about some of his previous events and the uh, fantastic work that he's done raising money for some uh, other charities. Uh, talks about the people that are going to be involved and some of the items that have been uh, donated to this and indeed the eBay auctions which are finishing over the course of the day. So there's some very unique and interesting Commodore, uh, it's Commodore themed this year, uh, hardware that's going to be for sale over the course of the day. It's all on the uh, the Befriending Scheme's official eBay page so all of the proceeds, 100% of the proceeds go directly to them immediately and there's also a Just Giving page which is uh, officially affiliated with them and all the proceeds from that uh, also go directly to the charity. So yeah, a uh, really, really uh, kind of well-organised thing and I would urge you to check this out. Um, there are links to information. I mean, I'll talk about some of the stuff. This is all covered in the video, which will be linked in the usual places. Uh, but there is a page over on morphin, morphinmakingit.co.uk with a lot more information and links to some of the items and the channels that are involved. Uh, there's stuff here. You know, they've got uh, Commodore VIC-20s. There's a very rare uh, early, you know, very rare early Commodores and things, VIC-20s, Commodore 16s. Uh, some very weird stuff. There's a mini pet which uh, aren't even available anymore, at least this specific version of the Mini Pet. Um, there's some quite rare Amigas. Um, there's a, a very fancy looking one that I was asked to sign the bottom of, along with some other uh, tech YouTubers. There is a joystick which is signed by Jerry Ellsworth. And she actually uh, designed that, of course, a really well known uh, and very well kind of respected uh, engineer in the Commodore world. Uh, there's so much stuff to go into here. so. All I will say is uh, go and check out the video over on Lee's channel. It's half an hour long, but he's very entertaining as always. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of really nice, cool tech to look at as well, uh, which is always good. And then indeed, if you find any time at all to drop in over the course of the day on Saturday, the 19th of October, we would be very glad to have you. So I'm going to be on from 1pm uh, to 3pm. That's UK time. And uh, I, there are also uh, other... Who is joining me? I don't know. I think Neil RMC is going to be in my slot. Uh, there we go. We've got CRG. We've got Retro Bytes. We've got uh, Jan Beters in my slot. Uh, the Rasteri, uh, you probably know him. Uh, Hack Build Restore. 
there's the list that's on one till three. Uh, and then there's, uh, so we're basically the hardware guys. There's also a software section and uh, yeah, <laughs> so much stuff to take in. I'm really, really looking forward to being a part of this and uh, it was a real honor to be asked to uh, take part as well. So very much looking forward to popping back to the studio tomorrow and uh, taking part in that. And then of course, hanging out for the rest of the day, chatting to people in the chat and uh, just hoping the live stream and those eBay auctions go down very well. So hopefully I will see you tomorrow for that event. But that's all I have for you for this week. Thank you ever so much for uh, entertaining me once more, for humoring me. Uh, for our time together, and I shall hopefully see you again very soon. Bye.